Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. She is a yoga teacher, an Ayurveda guide, an author. She has over 25 years of experience in this world. She holds accreditation with both Yoga Alliance and Yoga Australia as a registered uh, yoga teacher and teacher trainer, many thousands of teaching hours. Uh, She's a doula. She's a teacher for the Australian Doula College as well. She was the manager, and this is how we met many, many years ago, for those of you that live in the EU and the UK. Katie was the manager of Tri Yoga in London before she moved to Sydney and opened Samadhi Yoga in 2004. So that's where we met. She followed by uh, handling Jiva Mukti Yoga Sydney, which at its peak was a four studio business. Her popular online courses, though, are what kind of have me in thrall with this human. They've helped hundreds of women from all over the world to empower themselves. Much of her work focuses on the Australian seasons, landscape, indigenous culture. Uh, She has a keen passion for respecting First Nations wisdom, as well as animal rights and the environment. It's a very special human. She has about 80,000 children. (laughs) And (laughs) how many is it now, anyway? I have five children. I mean... You have so much courage. And you're also the founder and host of a summit that I've been a part of for a long time. It's called the Bhakti Women's Online Yoga Summit. It's such a sweet gathering. It's always very well attended. And um, I really appreciate that opportunity to serve your people. So thank you for that. And then you also have several books that you've published, including one called Mindful Living and one called The Yoga of Birth. So, welcome to the podcast, dear sister. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful to have you here. I am excited to talk to you a little bit about the sort of overarching work that you're doing, which is really Ayurveda. I've had a few different folks on the podcast thus far, and we've always had a wonderful chat. I had Guni Sodi here, Mark Holtzman. I'm becoming closer with a gal teacher by the name of uh, Radhika, who's also an Ayurvedic-centric mentor. I'm kind of obsessed with this entire body of uh, thought and teaching. Since you have this very robust online training in Ayurveda specifically for women, I would love to hear kind of what brought you to this personally and what you bring to the conversation broadly. Sure. Well, um, I mean, what brought me to it personally was the journey of managing yoga studios. And actually, it's sort of one of those serendipitous stories because I wasn't particularly drawn to Ayurveda. It wasn't an area that I was especially interested in. But when I was running a yoga studio in Sydney, it was really lovely back in 2004 when I first started running yoga schools. There was a very collaborative and community-based sentiment between everyone that ran a studio here like there were only five or six big schools because Sydney is a small city and we were all friendly you know it was really quite beautiful I remember one of my biggest I guess you would say competitors on the day that I opened actually sent me a bunch of flowers so it was really lovely anyway what happened was I was running my studio and I got a call one day from a colleague who ran another yoga studio we're double booked. We've got an Ayurveda teacher who's due to come in with a big crowd and we can't facilitate the gathering. We've got two bookings. Would you be willing to host this Ayurveda teacher in your studio? It's all ready to go. You just have to give us the space. And of course I said, yes. And that teacher was Maya Tawari, Mother Maya. Wow. Um, yes. Fun. And oh my it, God. It was just you know, I mean, it falls in your lap like that. You have to say yes. (laughs) Of course. And, um, it was really love at first sight for me. I mean, I just met mother Maya and I can honestly say almost instantly became a devotee of hers, became a, a dedicated student of hers. And from then, I mean, this was before I had children. I spent a lot of time traveling with her. We spent time together in the UK and in the States Um, I studied with her. I did many of her trainings. I I really became, yeah, her dedicated student. And that's where the love and the the teachings of Ayurveda sort of became embedded in my heart. 
She is a teacher who very much focuses on Ayurveda for women. I mean, those of the listeners who don't know her, she's a pioneer in the world of Ayurveda, but her particular focus is Ayurveda for women. Her most famous book is The Path of Practice, which is a very well-known book in the world of Ayurveda. So the interest in working with women kind of came from there, but grew and expanded because four of my children are boys. So for a long time, I lived in a world of very masculine energy and I still do. I mean, I live now with five boys in my home, five males, I should say. And so for me, my work is a beautiful opportunity to kind of balance all of that masculine energy that's present in my personal life with the divine feminine and the work, the women's work. Hmm. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And when it comes to the Bhakti Summit, I feel like you have such a deep connection to the women in your region in particular, but women from all over the world are in attendance there, as we know. I have my ideas, so I'm going to answer the question also. But how do you think women are so magnetized to your work? Because I think that is a question that I'm certain our listener would like to know, particularly people who are creating in the online space. People are magnetized to you. And I wonder if you have a thought as to why that is. And I know I have a thought as to why that is. Oh, you're so kind. I feel like there's a couple of things. One thing is, I'm not afraid to keep growing and changing as a teacher. And I feel that many people, when they take the seat of the teacher, it can become easy to get stuck in a particular modality or a particular message. And if you enjoy a reasonable amount of success with that, it can be hard to expand yourself. I think that's definitely a trap that many teachers fall into. And I've noticed particular pivotal moments in my own work and my own career where that could have happened. And I've always held myself accountable to reflecting in my work, my evolving practice. So as my journey of being human continues to unfold and I have different experiences and different interests and different teachers that I follow, for example, and books that I'm reading, themes that are emerging in my work, then I share that with my audience. And I think actually that's a strength rather than a weakness. It's not that the messages always have to be consistent or that you have to only do one thing. I think being multifaceted as a teacher and as a guide is very powerful. So I think that's one element. And then The other element I think is around this very interesting word community, which is a word I've been reflecting on deeply recently. I notice, particularly in the online space, that many so-called communities are actually quite hierarchical. There's a leader and then there's a sense that the people within the community are following the leader. And some of the messaging and some of the marketing that happens in those spaces is around making people within the communities feel less than or feel like they are imperfect and they need support and they need to learn something. And the suggestion is that there's a weakness that needs to be fixed. And for me, in my work, I strive and I pay attention to an even playing field. You know, in certain moments, I may be in the seat of the teacher or I may be in the seat of the guide, but I'm working through my own stuff just as much as anyone else in the space. And I'm really interested in conversations and gatherings that have at their heart an equal respect for every member. And I think that's true community. So, I hope that people that come into the spaces and the summit is a really good example of that. Just to give a very practical example, I really welcome and encourage and enjoy when people disagree with me, you know, when members of my community have a different perspective or a different opinion, or I think that adds great richness to the work. And I'm not sure that that's invited in every space in the online world. No, I don't think it is. What it sounds like to me, and I think this is definitely a part of my feedback too, you are willing to evolve in real time, in public, be fallible, continuous mistakes, <laughs> recalibrations, and uh, you're just another human. 
I'm trying. That's definitely a goal. And, you know, it translates to all areas, doesn't it? Because it's also a, such a big part of the parenting journey. That capacity. Oh, yes, exactly. Exactly. I don't know. I, I think you're refreshingly um, real. And when I look at your site, even your photographs, you know, there's something so approachable about the way you show up online, in such a beautiful way. Um, on your site, which is for our listener, if you want to go take a peek right now, it's Bhakti Rose, B H A K T I Rose dot com dot au. So it's again Bhakti Rose dot com dot au. Um, you have your Ayurveda Goddess online training. You have your Yoga of Birth, which is also a training that you do online pregnancy yoga. Really beautiful, simple website. You know, if you're listening to us and you're really interested in sort of creating online, this is a wonderful person to refer to. It's just so basic and also beautiful and also heartfelt and no bells and whistles, but everything is communicated. I would love to talk to you a little bit about what I see in terms of your kind of success what I see, aside from everything that we've spoken about, is you are also, as you mentioned, learning with us. You are not teaching us, necessarily. And I feel your humility, that's the word that I wanted to make sure I didn't forget to say today, your humility comes through in your work. And so if you're listening to us and you're really interested in Ayurveda, you're interested in teaching yoga to pregnant women, this is a wonderful, wonderful resource for you, this human. I also like the fact that I don't think your photos are retouched at all, which is something that I really love and appreciate. And I like your videos. There's something very just natural about how you communicate. I guess that's two decades of <laughs> doing something and then you get really comfy. But the practicality of it is really where I'm smitten with what you do online. Tell us a little bit about your parenting journey too. You and I have spoken about this before. I'd love to hear about how that's evolved. You have five children. You just had one. You're 45 years old. So if you're listening and you're older and you still want to have a baby, there is hope. Tell us everything. Sure. I mean, I'll just step back and speak very quickly about the photos. You're right. I don't retouch and I don't filter any of the photos on the website, which increasingly as I age, I have to remind myself that that's an important value because it's very, very tempting to want to just fiddle with them a little bit. But there's something about just showing up as my authentic self that's very important to me. And actually, funnily enough, I've done a few different professional photo shoots for my brand and for my website over time. And the, the, my favorite photos and the photos of the best ones on my website are most of them are taken by my partner at home. You know, the headshot photo, for example, that you'll be using for the podcast today. He took that in our backyard one afternoon when all the kids were around and it was chaotic and busy. I didn't even have makeup on. You know, I love the photos that are just in my home and very much me applying the teachings of yoga, the teachings of Ayurveda in my life and showing up as I do in the world as a mom and as a woman, as a yogi. It's lovely for me that you noticed that. Thank you. And for people who are starting out, you know, probably there are some listeners who are have their own online business and who are starting out building a website or, you know, putting together social media. I have a strong piece of advice or a strong suggestion that you don't need lots of bells and whistles. You don't need lots of fancy filters. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars on a photo shoot or a brand, you know, someone else to create your brand. Really, actually, what you need is a meditation practice because when you come into meditation, you will, over time, develop the capacity to show up as you are in the world. And that is then extended into the online space. So, yeah, that's something about the photos. Um parenting oh my goodness I mean I don't even know where to begin it's such a huge journey my eldest son is 16 he wants to become an electrician so he's planning on leaving high school at the end of next year and he's already started his apprenticeship he's very focused he's a very driven young man I'm incredibly proud of him he's a wonderful human and a wonderful older brother um, and then I have a 13-year-old, a 9-year-old, uh, and a 7-year-old. Those four 
children are boys and their father is my ex-husband. And then I got a divorce about five years ago. And after about oh, two or three years, I repartnered. And now I have another baby, a new baby girl. Uh, finally got my girl with my current partner. I mean, I, d- I don't even know where to begin with what to say about parenting. It's a wild mm. ride, as you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, one of the biggest lessons I've learned, and it's been a 16-year journey of almost continuous parenting, well, continuous parenting, one of the biggest things I've learned is to drop into gratitude for present moment experiences. I find it very easy to project forward. I'm a striver I like to create things. In Ayurveda, my constitutional type is pitta. It's all about fire and action. So if I'm not careful, I'm always rushing and I'm always projecting. And so I've trained myself over years to just drop into this present moment, this breakfast moment, this conversation with this individual child, this sunset, this swim, whatever it is, and to really engage and I think as a mother of a large family, one of the things that you're always very aware of is, am I giving my child or my children enough attention? Are they getting enough of me? Because I'm stretched in many directions. And so I've learned to give real quality of attention. Like I really make an active practice of giving quality of attention to each of them individually. And of course, what that looks like differs enormously. So, you know, with the 16 year old, it might be cooking a meal together or having an important conversation about something emotional that's going on in his life. And with the baby, that looks like getting down on the floor and, you know, playing with her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So beautiful to have this gamut of ages and needs at the moment. I can only imagine I don't want to say how stretched you must be, because I don't sense that you're very stretched. I, I can only imagine how resilient you must be is what I want to say, from being on the floor to looking up at your teenager and supporting his choice, no matter what it is. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And a big part of the success in that is I, again, this is something I've learned over time. I wasn't always good at this. In the beginning, when I first became a mum, there was a lot more resentment and there was a lot more of the martyring of myself and feeling like, oh, this is very hard. And I can honestly say, hand on heart, it's become easier and easier because these days I don't say yes to lots of things I don't want to do. I mean, of course, there's a certain amount of domestic just life that has to happen, but I quite enjoy that. I'm quite a domestic person. I'm quite a homebody. So I like cooking. I don't mind cleaning. Like cleaning for me is a a form of meditation, tidying, getting the house into order. These are all things that I don't mind. So in that way, I'm kind of hardwired to be a mother But, you know, the things I don't like, for example, I really, really don't enjoy watching sport. And my older children, both of them play rugby. I just don't really go and watch their games. And I'm completely honest with them. I'm like, you know, I love you. I'm here for you in so many ways. I show up fully in the ways that I'm able to, but I have no desire to stand on the side of a rugby pitch every Sunday morning and scream, you know, every time the ball is moved across the field. Like, it's just not part of what lights me up. And so I choose not to do that. And I hope what that models for the children is that they also are autonomous humans that can make choices around their lives rather than getting stuck into patterns and finding themselves in situations that aren't aligned with what's, you know, going to serve their best and highest interests. Well, I also know a handful of moms here in Santa Fe who can totally handle the screaming, shouting, freaking out on the sidelines on your behalf plenty of that here. It's funny to think of you like with a little tiny baby on the floor. I can't get the image out of my head and then the tall one just towering over. Actually, you know, the older kids are so amazing with the baby. It was hard for them when I first got pregnant. That was a very difficult phase in our family time because Mm. I think the boys had all thought I was done with babies and babies bring work and distraction and take a lot of energy. And so when I told them I was pregnant, it would definitely cause some upheaval. But now we move through that. And, and you were a very important guide and mentor to me through that time. Your words and your 
encouragement were of enormous support to me during that time. You know, we came through that and now everyone loves the baby. She gets so much attention. It's certainly not all on me. Right. Of course. I think I'm on my last couple of questions here for you, Katie. I'm wondering to sort of pick your brain a little bit about why a summit for our listener who might be interested in designing such a thing. I've designed, uh, now this is coming up on my third one, I'm doing a menopause summit that's entirely by donation to causes that I support. And then there's no like, I'm not doing any free days. It's just buy the content or don't buy the content. And it's going to be great. But I'm curious to know what compelled you to start this summit and what compels you to continue. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. It's a huge amount of work. And it's funny because sometimes people say to me, oh, I I like the idea of doing a summit. And my honest feedback is it's wonderful and it's rewarding and enriching, but it's a lot of work. The element of running in-person yoga spaces that I loved the most when I was at Tri Yoga and when I had my studios here in Sydney was bringing together wonderful teachers with my community of students. I loved hosting, you know, teachers coming in and running big workshops and big community events. You know, most of that happened back in the day before Zoom was really a thing and we had to fly teachers. I mean, you did this for many years. You know exactly what it's like you know, flying in, teaching a huge workshop, staying in a hotel. There's a lot of organization that goes behind that. But those events for me were such a highlight. And my job at Trioga, such a big part of it was organizing that and holding space for those events. And so when I transitioned my business into the online space, which I did about four years ago now, three or four years ago, I really got serious about online business before COVID, but only just before COVID. That was an element I missed. I missed those bigger events and that sort of bringing of people together in that way with guest teachers and people from all over the world. And the summit to me was a very obvious opportunity to replicate some of that enjoyment that I got from creating those in-person events. And of course, I was able to just cherry pick the teachers that I have adored and worked with over years that have brought so much light and so much joy and juice into my own practice and my own teaching and and bring them together to share and to be in community with such ease because no one has to get on an airplane, no one has to stay in a hotel, I don't have to hire a venue. It's just so easeful. <laughs> so different. Yeah. It's so different. And also it's fraught with its own perils. You know, you have to be on email for several hours many dozens of hours, in fact, to organize each person and their time frame and their topic and then make sure they have the bio and the headshot and all the right things and then have it designed. It's a whole thing. It's a whole world. Yeah. yeah and all I think that's helpful. Is a lot too. And I have this every year. I mean, we just did the third year of the summit. I have this nervousness around time zones and have I locked everyone in at the right time? Because a lot of my summit is live. I always breathe a sigh of relief when it's finished that I didn't stuff up and and sort of have a room full of people with no teacher or a teacher with no people. (laughs) All I know is you're crazy to do it live. Crazy. I love it. I'll do it as a guest, but I would never do that as a host. I like just having the content all ready to go and then let's watch it together, (laughs) you know, or let's listen together. Better for the nervous system that way. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. The last thing I wanted to call out, you just said, we were very lucky And I think we have a few listeners today who might be recognizing this fact that back in those days in the early 2000s, we had no idea that the days of yoga workshops and traveling and learning together in community, you know, would ever come to a screeching halt, which they did. They're coming back to some extent, but I don't think there's as much kind of latitude as there once was in that space. It's a different vibe. I'm just starting to pick up that traveling right now, but it's a different vibe, but I don't think it will ever be the same as it was. And I just wanted to kind of acknowledge my gratitude for the role that you played in getting me out there and helping that event to go off so smoothly as it did. And I ended up staying with Tri Yoga and teaching there for many, many, many years, all the way up until the pandemic. So thank you for that. Thank you for the organization and the care. Thank you. I mean, Tri Yoga has such a sweet and beautiful 
place in my heart. It was a beginning for me and so formative in so many ways. It's a, and it's such a sweet, precious and magical space. Same. And Jonathan, if you ever listen to this, thank you. We love you. I think that's all I wanted to talk to you about today. I really wanted to just introduce you to my listener who might not know of you to tout and flout your Ayurveda skills, your professionalism, your love, your care, and just share you with the world a little more. I want to thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Yeah, um, of course. It's such a privilege to chat with you. Thank you, Elena. I feel the same. And would you do me a big, huge flavor and send me a picture of that baby? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah, I don't tend to share many pictures on social media of my children, but I will certainly. I've got an amazing one of her the other day coming out of the swimming pool and she looks like a punk rocker. I'll send it to you. Genius, the mohawk. Yeah, I won't. (laughs) I promise I won't share. I understand that uh, the, the privacy aspect of it, but I just want to see what this face looks like. I can't even. 